across the globe by satellite. Join us for Welcome to Grace, where we'll discover together the distinctiveness of Paul's apostleship through the rightly divided word of truth. Now, join pastor and Bible teacher, Kirk Christ, as we explore the unsearchable riches of Christ. through the Bible, uh, let's take a quick look at where we are in relation to Paul's epistles and his three journeys. And we'll know how far we've come in this, in this journey through the Bible. Uh, Paul went first through Asia Minor, as we know, and that would be up on the left-hand side in the green, if you're watching this by way of video, uh, on the slide there, Asia Minor, and then into Macedonian Greece on his third journey. His first journey, Asia Minor only. His second journey, he retraced his steps through Asia Minor went into Greece and Macedonia on his third journey, uh, same thing, Asia and then Greece and Macedonia. So he covered that part of the world, and then finally his last trip was to Rome where he was put under house arrest. But you can see all three journeys on that Acts period illustration that I've, that I've created there. And you can also see on that illustration the order in which Paul wrote his epistles, his letters to the churches during that time. Now if you look in the darker shaded area from left to right, about three-quarters of the way down, light blue on our illustration here on our slide here, you can see that the letter to the Galatians was written immediately following journey number one. First and second Thessalonians came on his next journey, uh, journey number two, and then during journey number three, Paul wrote the two Corinthian epistles followed by his letter to the saints in Rome. So all these epistles, uh, first, uh, so many epistles, they're written during that period of time. He was journeying out, reaching people who had been born under the law that hadn't heard of the new economy, that needed to know about it and how God was working. It's the Romans letter that we've been examining in the latest messages, and I, uh, I'd like to complete our summary look at that epistle today so that we can move ahead to the Reader's Digest version, so to speak, of Paul's remaining seven letters as we continue to make our way through the Bible. Following Paul's letters will come what's been called the, the circumcision epistles, uh, Hebrews, and then finally all the way up to the, the book of the Revelation. I know this has been an extended journey for those following along. It's taken more than uh, more time than some people have. I've been asked, am I going to live long enough for you to get through this journey through the Bible? I hope I will live that long. But uh, just We've hit on the highlights only because we'd never get through the Bible if we were to go through everything and exhaust every verse. But uh, we've hit on the highlights already, if you think of it, of 48 books of the Bible. And uh, 30 books that are the old, known as the Old Testament scriptures, we've covered all those, along with le 11 out of the 27 books that are commonly called the New Testament. So we've come quite a, quite a ways. And, of course, we know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, along with the first eight chapters of the book of Acts, concerned themselves with Christ's earthly ministry to people that were under the law contract, to, to specifically to the nation Israel, uh, not with the economy of grace that the Apostle Paul, the new apostle, was sent to, to make all men know, even the men of the uh, earthly kingdom promised. Uh, so out of the 66 books contained in the Bible, we've conducted a century look at, uh, cursory I should say, look at 50 of those thus far. So we're making some good progress. Um, we'll not spend more time in those books uh, until later on. But uh, to provide a little hope, we're, we're nearly 75% of, uh, of the way through our journey through the Bible uh, at this point in time. So uh, I've given each of Paul's letters what I like to think of or call a handbook title. Uh, other pastors have done that. It's nothing new. My titles would be different as I see them a little bit differently. But, uh, for instance, I've called Paul's letter to the saints in Galatia, Paul's handbook on liberty. Uh, some would say his handbook on faith, and we've talked about it being a faith epistle. But in this book, I'm calling it Paul's handbook on liberty because Paul there expresses the freedom that we have in Christ. And he contrasts salvation by grace um, apart from the law program, apart from conduct. He makes that, con that contrast, and we are free uh, today. And so I call it Paul's Handbook on Liberty, and free from that performance system called the law contract that God placed Israel under as a nation. And then came his two letters to the saints in Thessalonica, where we learned about the hope that every believer of every age shares, this one hope. Um, naturally, I've called that letter Paul's Handbook on Hope. And... Uh, 
I think we're all looking with great anticipation to that day when we're caught up off this planet and we can see every day. If you, all you have to do is turn your television on and you can see the downward trek of society and where we're headed. Um, and yes, they kick the can down the road and it's like a pendulum that swings back and forth. Everything gets really bad and then everything comes back the other way. And, uh, but the pendulum's swinging ever lower all the time. Um, you know, uh, probably as well as I do, that if you're closer to my age than to Addison's age out here, uh, Elisa, uh, Ellen, you're, you're still very young. <laughs> but you know as well as I do that, that you guys can see right now on your TV set, no matter the time. It's not like it used to be. Well, after 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, you're seeing things on your TV set that weren't shown in my day. Uh, I would be had been deeply embarrassed to sit down with my grandmother and watch what's being portrayed today, or my mother for that. Things are changing. The bar's being lowered, and we're moving downward. So we have that hope Paul talks about in, in the letter to the saints in Thessalonica. And uh, I'm looking for the, of course, we're all looking for the upper taker rather than the undertaker, <laughs> but we don't know when that'll be. And uh, and I was waiting for it and talking about it and hoping for it when I was very young and and, and began teaching. And still looking for it today, but you know this generation and generations to come may still be here uh, before Christ catches us home to be with Him. So we just live every day the best we can, and uh, do the best we can to get the message of grace, the the gospel of, of Christ out. Seems the older we get, the more anxious we become uh, <laughs> for that upper taker. Well, Paul gave comfort, the comfort of hope, in the two letters to Thessalonica. That's why I call him his handbook on hope. His two letters to the saints in Corinth. First and Second Corinthians, often known as the love epistles, and they are indeed that, I've entitled his handbook on humility. Pride was in full bloom, bloom as we all know, in Corinth. As these saints were arguably the most carnally minded or fleshly minded group to whom Paul would ever write. Uh, the humility that comes from spiritual growth was sorely needed in Corinth. Uh, they needed to move from satisfying self to serving others. They needed to be other-focused rather than self-focused. And, and I think that applies to our assembly and to every assembly out there today. Do we come to get? Do we come for what we can gain? Or do we come to give? Do we come for the sole purpose of, of providing what we have to provide for others out there? Are we here to get? And if we don't get what we want, then we're not interested any longer. That's a major point, folks. Uh, we're now looking at Paul's handbook on faith. And that's his Romans epistle where we learn those great doctrines of justification, sanctification, dispensation, finally presentation, based on everything that's been done for us without any cause in us to have merited it. We don't deserve it. Christ gave it all to us and he gave it to us freely. What Christ did at Calvary was enough for God to unleash his, his package of, of grace and blessings in its entirety. Turn it over and empty it out, dump it out, so to speak, on all of us today. So we already have everything that we're, we need to get from, from God today. It's already been dumped out on us. These blessings are ours right now. Um, so, you know, the idea is what do we owe others? And that's the title I've given this message is Our Debt of Agape. Uh, so we're now looking at his handbook on faith where we learned those, those great doctrinal truths that have to do with faith and our belief. And, uh, and in Romans, we learned about the judgment seat of Christ as we came through this book. Uh, we, every believer will be evaluated based on their work of faith, their patience of hope, and their labor of love. Love being the ultimate level of spiritual maturity. Uh, it only stands to reason that in light of these great doctrines taught in the first three sections, or we called them cornerstones of the book of Romans, um, would come the cornerstone, the final cornerstone, called the cornerstone of presentation. Based on being justified freely by His grace, based on the fact that he not only justified us once we believed that we were, uh, that the cross accomplished everything that needs to be accomplished where our sins are concerned, God joins us to his son, sanctification. That's just our set apartness, our identity in Christ. So the moment you believed, you took on a brand new identity. And I know we're rehashing some things we've covered, but uh, next came dispensation. What happened to that law program? What happened to God's program with the nation Israel under the law? What happened to that law contract? That's called dispensation or economy, where Paul says, we're in a different economy today. And now God's telling all men, even those saints of the earthly kingdom promise, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, all the apostles, uh, the 12, Paul was sent to let everybody know how God's now working with all men across the board, even those guys. Will they still get their earthly 
blessings that God's promised them, their earthly promises, yes, they will. They'll get them literally. Paul said, we are not given their earthly things. We've been, been become partakers of their spiritual things. So that's our tie-in to the new covenant. I, I hope to do a message, maybe uh, next Sunday, maybe the following one. I hope to do a message on the difference in the earthly blessings and the spiritual. The difference in the earthly things and the spiritual things. You see where we are and what we're not promised at all. But what they've got, the same thing we've now got, which is spiritual things. Uh, belongs to them. So based on all these truths, justification, sanctification, the new economies, economy of grace comes presentation. How do we conduct ourselves in the light of we're not under law? We don't have to do anything. Is there anything unlawful for us today for people under grace? Not a thing. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but all things don't build me up. All things don't help others. All things aren't good for my edification and uh, edification of others. My loose paraphrase. So yes, we can keep our body under, we can control our impulses and our fleshly desires, uh, and we can do that in a debt that we owe. Paul says that we owe it to everybody, and it's a debt called agape. It's a debt called love. How does it operate? Well, Paul gives us that as well, but we are now in this behavioral section, the last section. Paul always, isn't it interesting, Paul doesn't start out with scolding us. Paul never starts out, and even in Corinth, the fleshly-minded folk, everything was taking place in that assembly, things that we wouldn't imagine here. Maybe we would, I don't know, but horrible things were taking place in that assembly, openly. And they were bragging about their right to do these things. And it came to Paul's attention that it was well-known everywhere with things that were taking place in Corinth. And yet Paul doesn't open his letter and say, okay, I need to call you folks down on some things. Now listen here, you should stop doing this. You should stop doing that. Why are you doing it? He doesn't start there at all. In every epistle, no matter how carnally minded the group or the problem in that letter, he begins with who we are in Christ and commends them. Now, he always starts with commendation, finds the good, praises them for the good. And then when he finishes up, he says, now, based on who you already are, this is how you should conduct yourself. And then he tells us how to conduct ourselves based upon who God's already made us to be in Christ. So this is the section we're in now, the last cornerstone, and probably finish it up today. In Romans, where Paul urges believers, in light of all that God's already done for us and done it freely, to present ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God in appreciation for His multiple mercies and His, and His grace. This is appreciation, not service out of apprehension, but service, service out of appreciation. And God and Paul both called it our reasonable worship. So coming here on a Sunday morning is not your worship. Yes, you can worship while you're here on Sunday morning. Uh, how do you do that? By serving other people in the body, by encouraging other people in the body, by getting to know them and appreciate them and love them and fellowship as a body. You can do that here on Sunday morning, but this is something we owe every day, of, every minute of our lives. And I think a lot of times we think of fellowship as well. It's going on Sunday morning and getting with the people on Sunday morning. No, it's every day of our lives. It's not just Sunday morning. So how do we encourage each other when we're not in this building? Um, you know, I was raised early on with a, a pastor that was terrifically influenced, influential in my life. And I heard him say one time, don't rely on the pastor to do this. Uh, and his statement was, I'm not here to hold your hands. I'm not here to, to, to do all those things. I'm not here to babysit you folks. Doctrine does that. If doctrine doesn't get you through, what are you going to do when I'm not here? Where are you going to go when I'm not here? It's the doctrine that should build you up and you should live off that doctrine that you have firmly established in your minds because I may not always be here. You know, I know you haven't noticed. It's, I keep it hidden well, but I'm getting older. <laughs> and when you get to the age I am right now, I'm slowing down a little bit. I'm cutting down on the time of my messages, although this one will probably go longer than I anticipated. But I'm here to tell you that I won't always be here. So the, you know, it's not my job to tell you what to do the doctrine you're hearing about this love we're talking about is what you're to do on your own, not to depend upon me to make you do it or force you to do it or, or do it myself. The pastoring role comes through the doctrine, doctrinal intake. Somebody said, well, you can be a pastor or you can be a teacher. Maybe you're a good teacher and a lousy pastor. Well, I would agree with that. Probably a lousy pastor too, a teacher in a lot of ways. Um, 
I hear others, and I say, man, I wish I could teach like that, <laughs> you know? But it's just different. You know, everybody learns from different people, and everybody has something to say. And we learn from each other, and we build each other up and encourage each other, and we learn from each other. But um, understand it's not the pastor's role. I'm doing, exercising what some would call my gift, which is teaching. That's what I do. I'm here at 10.30 in the morning when I'm here, and I really let you folks down. Last year, I wasn't here a lot of the time, but... Um, you know, I need to be here too, fulfilling my role in the body. And you've got a role. Everybody has a role to play. And, uh, and so we all need to, to fellowship with each other and have that love for one another, whether I'm here, whether I'm not. Uh, so anyway, we have a debt because of everything that God's done for us freely, regardless of what we did for him. We have a debt. And that debt is agape. And Paul says, you owe it to every single person. And God considers that your reasonable worship. He's not being unreasonable, not asking you something that's out of reason or not logical for you to do. He's saying, this is your logical response. You know, think about other people. Uh, so I've entitled it, as I said, the debt of agape. We talked about it many years ago, but still kind of harping on it today. Um, and then we're prepared to move into Paul's handbook on unity uh, in his letter to the saints in Ephesus. They were dividing. You had different doctrinal or different views. God doesn't even tell us what the argument was. Isn't that amazing? He doesn't say, well, don't make the mistake these folks made. Why? It didn't matter. It didn't matter what was pr the problem was. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, I like to call her name Euodius and, uh, and Syntyche. And I, some people have said, you're odious and you're soon touchy. Whatever it was between these two ladies caused dissension in the fellowship. There was a great conflict. People were doing what? Choosing sides. That's what they were doing. Oh, I'm with her. Well, I'm with this one over here. And what did it cause? Division. There is never division among people unless there's pride involved in the division. Always. Not getting what I deserve. So-and-so got what I deserve. You know, I got something that's less than so-and-so is getting. Always at the heart of every division is human pride. Uh, how many of us don't have it? <laughs> I think that's why Paul said we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that power may not be of us but be of God. Uh, we all have it and we all exercise it. I exercise my share of it and we all do from time to time. So um, we've got this doctrinal handbook in Ephesians on unity. Don't be dividing. Love and unity, folks, are so closely related that we can see why Paul followed his letter to the saints in Rome with his letter to the Ephesian assemblies. Um, Let's quickly read through the final verses of Romans chapter 13 to just get a broader view of the setting here. We'll begin with verse 8, which will be the focal point of our lesson. And this verse could very well stand on its own. You know it quite well. Owe no man anything, Paul wrote. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. We're going to talk about this verse uh, today. For this, Paul writes in verse 9, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbors as you love yourselves. Um, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation, our deliverance, nearer than when we believed. Verse 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering. Does anybody know what that means? Now the word chambering in the Greek is actually, today's vernacular, stop sleeping around, <laughs> not sleeping around, chambering, and wantonness, wantonness or licentiousness, uh, showing no moral restraint whatsoever, not in strife and envying. Uh, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. So Paul's telling us here in his final cornerstone of Romans how to make our behavior, to bring our behavior more into alignment with who God's already made us to be in Christ. He's not telling us how to behave in order to gain God's favor, uh, not telling us how to behave in order to get more blessings from God. He's not telling us how to behave... Uh, uh, how to conduct ourselves in order to become more righteous in the eyes of God. He's telling us how we should present ourselves on a practical level given who God's already made us to be by joining us to the person of His Son, spiritually speaking. 
So in our very first verse, Paul presents an interesting statement with his words, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And then immediately following this verse, catch what he says here, right after saying, Owe no man anything but to love one another, he went on to give us this list of thou shalt nots. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. At first glance, does it not appear as though our apostles taking us right back to the law of Moses? That's there. These are all part of the law contract under which God had placed the nation Israel. Why would Paul take believers of this present economy, this present dispensation of the grace of God, back to the law of Moses... Since we're not under the law of Moses and have never been as Gentiles, but under grace, as Paul stated in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Listen to Paul. For sin shall not have dominion over you. There's no rulership that sin can have over you at all, for ye are not under the law. You're under grace. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. All things are lawful for me, Paul said, but all things aren't good for me or for other people. They don't edify. While the law will never go away ever in that the law of Moses will stand forevermore, as a testament, that's what it's called, the Old Testament, or the, the testament, the law, it'll stand forevermore as to a statement of the failure of all mankind to merit righteousness by way of performance. The law will always be there to present that. No man can measure up, and the law proves that to us. Uh, so, but the law was indeed nailed to the cross of Christ in that Christ fulfilled all the demands, every last detail of the law, so that his righteousness could be credited freely put on our test papers, I often say, in heaven, based on simple belief, simply taking God at his word. It's, it's credited, his righteousness, credited to the account of everyone who's believed the gospel that God's presented to them, and even those folks who believe the gospel that was presented to them back in history past. Those folks who were of the household of faith. Guess how they'll be saved? By having Christ credited, Christ's righteousness credited to their account. Did they know that? No. God kept it secret. God kept secret how he was, what he was going to do and how he was going to do it to his household of faith that began with Adam and Eve. He kept it secret till it was time for God to reveal it to Paul and tell Paul, make everybody see it, Paul. God could not join his household of faith beginning with Adam and Eve. He could not join them to his pers person of his son so that his son would have Christ's righteousness until Christ fulfilled all righteousness. That's why he didn't make it known earlier. He waited if Satan had known that God's master plan, his purpose, his secret plan, was to join all who would take him at his word, as that word was progressively revealed, uh, he was going to join those people to his son so that those people would inherit Christ's resurrection life that came from Christ's faithfulness. Then the best way to keep you from having that credited to your account would be to have Christ not rise again. You think there was an effort in that day to keep Christ in that tomb? We all heard, have heard about the, the rock, the stone that was rolled away. But there's a better way to keep Christ's righteousness uh, credited to you by you being joined to his resurrection life. And that's for Christ not to have resurrection life at all. And the best way to have him not die and have that resurre resurrection life is to keep him from being crucified. So had Satan known God's master plan, Christ would never have been crucified. We could never have been joined to his resurrection life. And if Christ had no sin, would he have ever died? Uh-uh. <laughs> he took on the sins of mankind at Calvary. But without sin, he would never have died. Okay, let's look at uh, Paul's words in Colossians. I'm sure many of you recall his words here. Colossians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. You, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath God quickened together with Christ, having forgiven you, how many? All trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of... Now, this is an important word. Keep it in your minds. Blotting out the handwriting of commandments, judgments, ordinances. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Yet back in Romans chapter 13, verse 9, it looks like Paul's pointing us back today, believers, back today to the law of Moses. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Why would Paul be bringing at least a portion of the law of Moses right back into the picture? Well, perhaps a, a better question to have asked is, what is our relationship as believers today? What is our relationship in this dispensation to the law of Moses? And do we even have a relationship to the law of Moses? If Christ fulfilled the law, 
if the law was nailed to the cross of Christ, and if we are not under the law in the first place, but under grace, then why would Paul point us back to the law of Moses? That's where I want to take you today. To understand what's happening here, we have to understand something about the law of Moses. And then I think the picture will become much clearer. Let's take a few moments to examine the law of Moses, and I'll show you just what I'm talking about here. First of all, the law of Moses can generally be divided into three major categories. Actually, two. You probably see them at the top of the slide there if you're watching this by way of video. The law of Moses is generally divided into two major categories. There's a third one under that, but there were the commandments. What do we think of when we think of the commandments? Ten commandments, right? There were the ordinances, and there were the judgments. So the law wasn't just one thing. It was comprised of different sections. The two major ones, ordinances and judgments. Those were the two major ones. The commandments, we're going to take a look at that in a few moments. But do you understand the differences in those three components of the law contract? And you can see it's an open book test. I put the two differences right there on the, on the video there for you folks watching by way of, of video to see. Let's briefly review those two. When we think of the commandments, our minds immediately go back to the Ten Commandments. The ordinance portion of the law had to do with that part of the contract that had to do with Israel's religious practices, her religious rites and rituals, the tabernacle, the temple, the sacrifices. All that was part of the ordinance section of the law contract because the ordinance section of the law contract was meant to govern man's relationship with God. The ordinances were vertical. This would include the priesthood, as I said, the rites, the rituals, all the religious things, the religious practices, and that's what Israel's religion was all about. Then a third aspect of the law of Moses was that which is sometimes called the judgments. Well, I should say the second. The judgments was that part of the law that had to do with the day-to-day -day rules for living that God gave to the nation of Israel. So those weren't meant to govern man's relationship with God. They were meant to govern God's relationship, with man's relationship with man. So while the ordinances were this way, the judgments were, were intended to rule or govern man's relationship with other men. Uh, the judgments and the ordinances taken together were the two major components of the law contract. The ordinances were meant to govern the people of Israel's relationship with God. Just have that in your mind. This is where all those rites and rituals came into play. And the judgments, how we should conduct ourselves under that law with other people. So the, so uh, we've got those two. It's important to distinguish the difference in, in that, those two parts of the law in your minds. And I'll show you where in a few minutes. So here it is again. The ordinances were man-to-God related. The judgments were man-to-man -man related. The ordinances were given to guide their relationship and dictate their relationship with God. The, the judgments, man-to-man. -man. So you might ask about the Ten Commandments because you see that listed under those ordinances and judgments. What about the Ten Commandments? Where do they fit in? They're a summation of sorts of both parts of the law. The Ten Commandments actually summarize both of the two major components of the law, the ordinances and the judgments. Let's quickly look back at Exodus chapter 20 where we find the Ten Commandments. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. The first four commandments had to do with man's relationship to God. And the remaining six had to do with man's relationship with man. So the Ten Commandments just boiled it down, didn't they? Into, into ten things. Look at the camp, commandment number one, Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And here's commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Is that this way or is that this way? That's an ordinance, isn't it? We're sitting there in the Ten Commandments. First thing's an ordinance. Um, designed to, to govern Israel's relationship with God. God would have Israel acknowledge him alone as God. Not first and foremost, along with some others tailing behind, but alone, God alone. Notice uh, Hezekiah's words in, in his recognition of the Most High God in 2 Kings 19.15. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou, and the next word's very important, alone. There's no God beside you. You're the only God. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. The psalmist said it, Hezekiah echoed it, because the law required it. Uh, the first commandment stated that they would have no gods before God. God, Jehovah, was the Jehovah God was the only true God, capital G, and the people of the nation of Israel were to honor him as such. That governed their relationship with God. So you can see commandment number one, ordinance related. The same is true of second commandment. Here it is in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, the first part of verse 5, a commandment concerning idolatry, which again was Israel, Godward. Thou shalt make 
not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. In other words, they were to worship nothing in the place of the Most High God. To do so would, be, would constitute idolatry. Look quickly at the third commandment and tell me if this is man to man related or man to God related. Commandment number three in verse seven. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The Israelites were not to use God's name in a hollow vein or empty of substance manner. Uh, certainly profanity that included his name would have been included in that, using his, God with, using his name without any substance involved. But claiming a relationship with God or putting God to the test apart from taking God at his word would also have been taking his name or using his name in an empty manner, in a hollow manner. So again, the third commandment is a rule governing man's relationship with God. Fourth does the same as the first three. Notice the fourth commandment in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So you can see the first four commandments dealt with man's relationship with God. But now the commandments take on a different direction, or the law does, because the next, well, the commandments do here, because the next six of the, of the mighty ten, we could say, numbers five through ten, address the other side of the coin. They're not man Godward. They're man manward. They were intended to govern man's relationship with other men. Commandment number five is found in verse 12. Take a quick look. In fact, let me show you the remaining commandments all at one time. And you'll see the man-to-man -man direction at first glance of, as these are found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 12 through 17. We'll begin with verse 12 and commandment number 5. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor thy father and thy mother, man-to-man. -man. Commandment number 6 in verse 13, thou shalt not kill. Number 7, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number 8, Thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Number 10 is in verse 17. Number 10 is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Or thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. Don't covet that. So in effect, we see a summarization of sorts of the, a condensing down of the ordinance and judgment side of the law, 613 directives narrowed down to 10 that have both involved in them. And as I'm sure most of you are aware, the 10 could be narrowed down even further, could they not? <laughs> they could be brought down to two. And we know that the Lord did that very thing. Uh, how many are familiar with the statement Christ made in Matthew chapter 22? You will be as soon as you see it. Uh, when he was asked this question by a religious leader of, of his day, here it is in verses 35 and 36. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, an unbelieving pharisaical guy, asked him a question, tempting him. Okay, that's what the word tempt is in that word, uh, taking his name in vain. The meaning there is tempt. So here this guy didn't believe him, but he was using his, taking his name in vain here. Uh, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? In other words, what's the most important one? Uh, notice the Lord Jesus Christ didn't even go back to the Ten Commandments. He didn't go back. He didn't go back to the 613 aspects of the law. He breaks the law further down into two basic ideas. What are they? Well, here they are in this very familiar passage, the next four verses in Matthew, verses 37 through 40, Matthew chapter 22. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Is that this way? Ordinance related. And with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Category number one, a commandment man to God word is summarized in that single statement. Then comes verses 39 and 40. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as, thy, as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see, I said, love me with everything you got. Love your, love your neighbor just as much as you love yourself. Um, so we see a narrowing down concept, don't we? Now, it started with 613. It come, boiled down to 10. Now boiled down to two ideas. God's making it easier and easier. Um, if man was able to do it successfully. Uh, first of all, Israel had the entire law, 613 rules and regulations. Then we saw it condensed to 10. There in Matthew, he condensed it down even further. Do you think it could be condensed down even further from the two? It can. The entire law can be condensed down to one word. Isn't that amazing? 
And I know you know what that word is. What single word am I talking about? It's the word love. In the English, agape in the Greek. Uh, Watch the apostle as he condenses the law down to one single concept. He does that in the very first verse we read as we opened today's study, Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Watch, for he that loveth another hath done what? Fulfilled the law. Do you suppose we ever really love one another properly? We don't. We don't. Sorry, guys, you don't love your wives properly. The wives don't love the husbands properly. We don't even love our children properly, even though we die for them, because God is love. And if we could love appropriately, if we could love to the measure that God loved, we'd be God, and we're not. (laughs) So we have this treasure in earth and vessels, and we do the best we can. But Paul's bringing us back here in a letter, the final letter he would write before he went to prison. He's bringing us back here to this idea of what we owe people based on everything he's told us in those other letters that, that preceded this one. The spirit of the entire law would be fulfilled, satisfied, we could say, Paul's telling us here, if everyone would simply practice agape toward everyone else. Now, there's something very important to notice at this point. Let's look at the direction that Paul's now bringing to our attention. Here it is in Romans chapter 13, beginning with verses 9 and 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For this, verse 9, for this. In other words, in connection with practicing agape and loving one another, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, as briefly commanded in this, saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In what way would the practice of agape fulfill the law? Paul explains it in the very next verse. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. (laughs) Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Have you noticed which category is missing in Paul's directing direction in that one verse? Love your neighbor, love, owe no man anything but to love one another. There's a category missing up there in the category of the laws that I, that I gave you earlier because Paul's working man to man. He's telling about how the judgments, how if we could love, we'd be fulfilling the judgment aspect of the law, but he left out the ordinance section. Why would Paul leave out a category dealing with man's relationship to God when he's telling us to love one another. Well, he left out man's relationship with God, and it's interesting he did that. The simple answer is because God was demonstrating to Israel through that law that they could never achieve a righteous standing before him according to the law contract. In other words, they could never merit a relationship with God based on performance. It wouldn't be possible. Uh, What had the apostle of the nation told the Most High God? Give us a law, or the people, the nation Israel, give us a law. We'll do every bit of it. We'll perform it perfectly, and you can consider us righteous to the degree that we live up to it. Deuteronomy 6.25, my loose paraphrase. So what did God do? He placed in front of them that which it would take to earn his righteous standing before him by way of their performance. If they were to earn a righteousness before God, fulfilling the entire law without missing a single beat or a single moment would be the standard of performance required to merit righteousness. How many of us do that? What did James say? James 2 verse 10, For whoever shall keep the entire law and yet offend in one single point, he's blown it out of the water. He's guilty of how much? He's guilty of the whole works. To break a single directive of the law contract is to be guilty of breaking the entire contract. As we all now know, Israel never succeeded in keeping that law contract, according to the apostles. So, Paul left the ordinance section out because our relationship with God has already been established by Christ. He's not telling us how to have a relationship with God. He's simply saying, believe what he did for you. Just believe what he did for you and he'll join you. He'll join you to his son. So we're told simply to believe what Christ has already done. It's not about gaining or earning a relationship with God through behavior. Behavior is no part of it whatsoever. So Paul left that part out. We narrowed it all down to love. It's been fulfilled. The ordinance section, man's relationship with God, has been satisfied. Um, There's not a single mention of law-keeping in order to merit God's favor. So rather than go back to the performance of the law when it comes to meriting righteousness before God, man, God-word, Paul spent the entirety of the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, the justification, sanctification cornerstones, to show it how it is, to show us how it is that he considers us righteous today. Justification, sanctification. Uh, And 
So believing God has always been God's criteria for joining per people to his son. Don't let another statement that Paul made earlier trip you up here. Let me show you that one. The statement I'm talking about is Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Let's take a quick look. Do we then make the void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. Paul would say, get back under the law. That's not what he's saying there. In what way do we believers establish the law by way of faith? We establish or recognize the law to be valid by understanding that consistently perfect performance was the only way that a man could ever be considered righteous by way of his conduct. That's how we establish the law. Because the law was God's perfect standard when it came to earning righteousness before him by, by our behavior. Uh, therefore, the law would never be able to accomplish a right relationship with God. It was weak through the flesh. The law was never given for that purpose in the first place. It was given to prove man's need of a savior that Savior being the Lord Jesus Christ. How is our relationship with God established according to the Apostle Paul? It's established by believing the gospel that Paul's revealed to us. Uh, notice Paul's statement, Romans 3, verses 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God, without or totally apart from, is the, is the definition of that word without there, the law is manifest or clearly seen now, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Christ, Jesus Christ, unto all and up all in them that believe, for there is no difference. Don't misunderstand Paul here. He isn't saying there was a time when men could actually be saved by law keeping. But that's no longer the case. That was gospel number one. Now we've got a different gospel. So those folks back there were saved by faith plus what word? Works, not today. Now we're saved by faith apart from any works whatsoever. But those folks, they had a different gospel. They were saved by faith plus their works. I believed that. I taught that for, for a long time because I was taught to teach that. I was taught what I believed uh, until I studied it out. For my, no man was ever saved by his faith plus his works. No man ever of any time. Every man was saved based solely on the basis of faith. Grace through faith. It's always been there. Ephesians 3, 8, and 9 works for everybody. 3, 8, 9, 2, 8, and 1. Am I messing it up? Uh, it, it's worked the same way for everybody of every dispensation. God's looked at a man whether he'd take him at his word or not. Um, and it wasn't the works that saved, it was the faith. The law proved the inability of humankind to keep it. Paul's just told us it comes by faith, the faith belonging to the faith of Jesus Christ, not faith in him, the righteousness of God which is by faith that belongs to Jesus Christ. So we're only righteous because we have his righteousness given to us. It's his faith, his righteousness. Um, believe what we, we, we might ask. Well, the answer is to believe the good news that Paul's just revealed to us. Uh, so we know the gospel, the gospel of Christ. Does adherence to the law standard have any part to play, any role to play uh, whatsoever in the establishment of a person's righteousness before God? Paul provided the answer. Here it is in Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude once again that man is justified by faith without, totally apart from, the deeds of the law. Never fall for the notion, I know that many have taught it, many have fallen for it, that the Jews under the law program were justified by faith plus their works, but today righteous standing before God comes by way of faith without any works. Um, the law and the prophets, prophets witnessed that the righteousness came by faith apart from the law. So that's always been a, a faulty premise. A righteous standing before God has always come by faith and by faith alone. Uh, so the message to be believed has been progressively revealed. But it's always been just taking God at his word as to the message. Since our relationship with God has already been and solely based upon faith in God's good news, as that news was being revealed, there are no rules, no regulations, no rituals, no rights according to a law contract that govern man's relationship with God. We can go back, as many do today, to a rite or a ritual practiced to think that God's looking upon us as being more spiritual, uh, fulfilling this or fulfilling that or making a picture of this or a picture of that. As I once said, and I've said many times, Christ was never buried in water. He was buried in a tomb. So it's not a picture of his burial. Water's not a picture of his burial. I said it wrongly on a tape years ago. I said, Christ was never baptized in water in the first place. And I messed the word, <laughs> mixed the word baptized with buried. He was never buried in water, ever. So we've been justified freely according to the Apostle Paul. No law contract, no performance standard, no behavior requirements at all in order to be declared perfectly righteous in the eyes of Almighty God. 
That's what being justified freely is all about. Question then is this. What's Paul doing in Romans chapter 13 when he lists thou shalt nots in Romans 9 and 10? If he's not talking about man's relationship Godward, then what is he talking about? It becomes pretty obvious. He's talking about man's relationship with other men. That's what he's doing there. In other words, he's telling us how we ought to present ourselves to others based upon the fact that Christ did all that was required to establish our relationship with God by grace through faith alone. So this is how we can, should conduct ourselves. Do we have to do that? No. <laughs> but he's saying that would be love. If you want to love somebody, which is the only commandment today, the only directive, you owe it, then these are things you won't be doing. However, that second aspect of the law that governs man's relationship with man is where Paul's taking us in Romans chapter 13 with those thou shalt nots. Um, as I said, none of us will fill it perfectly. Um, Try not to covet sometime. You know, Paul, I, I think it's very telling that Paul would tell us his problem. The apostle of grace, the man that I wouldn't be worthy of even carrying his briefcase or lacing up his sandals. And yet he's telling us he had a problem. When the law said, thou shalt not covet, Paul, he said, I died. <laughs> Did I keep it? Oh, you couldn't point to Paul and say, look at his failure. Look at poor Paul where he broke the law there. He was blameless according to the law. Nobody could point to Paul and say, oh, Paul, you broke that commandment. Nobody could. He didn't. He didn't openly. But part of those commandments governed man's mind. And they didn't know what was going on in Paul's mind. And he said, when the law said, don't covet, I died. <laughs> so Paul had a, a problem of coveting. Do any of us? I don't know if you remember years ago when Kenny, our, my dear friend Kenny Tucker, who played the piano for us years ago, uh, and I went to the Goldwing show at the, at the state fair uh, they had all the gold wings from all over the country with all their was touring bikes, beautiful big red and burgundy, all colors with, with uh, trailers that were made to look like everything from coffins to front ends of cars. And I walked through there and we were both looking at these, marveling at these, and Kenny kind of looked at me with his head down and he says, are you coveting? <laughs> and I said, Kenny, we could throw a Bible in the back end. Would that help? <laughs> he said, no, that won't help. Uh, we should certainly live in accordance with who God's already made us to be in, fact, in Christ. In fact, due to all that Christ already accomplished on our behalf and did so without anything in us to have merited it, uh, we owe it to others to deal with them in the manner that Paul's spelling it out for us here in Romans chapter 13. Look back at passage, uh, the verses 9 and 10 once again. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment as briefly comprehended, co comprehended in this statement or this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself. This has nothing whatsoever to do with the ordinance section of Israel's law contract. This is solely to do with man's relationship with other believers, and Paul narrowed that down to one word, and he called it love. Um, love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling the law. Love will always do what's in the other person's best interest. Never bring harm, never bring injury, uh, never bring division. Love will do always that which edifies the body. Uh, owe no man anything but to love one another, we, we're told there. It's a debt. It's a debt that every believer owes each and every day to every other believer. We're to continually strive for the greater degree of it. It's one of Paul's never enough words. He commends them for their great love. And then he says, I would that you'd strive to abound even more. <laughs> so as much as Paul said, I, wow, it's known, your love is known across the land. Could you just do a little bit more? <laughs> could, you, could you have a little bit more love? Um, it's Paul's never enough word, as I say. When the Israelites looked at the judgment portion of the law of Moses, they were actually looking at a statement from God as to what it means to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let's go back and focus a little more closely on how agape fulfills that picture. We'll briefly take each one of Paul's agape statements and see how it works here. Statement number one, sitting in verse 9, Paul just said, For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Stop there for just a moment. How does agape love fulfill this commandment? Thou shalt not commit a, a, adultery. Our union with our, our mate is a picture of our union with Christ. We're one with Christ and we're one with the one we're married to. They two leave their father and man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and they too become one flesh. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, we're joined to Christ. We're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are the body of Christ, perfectly united in him, joined to him in a unique and eternal union relationship. And Christ, God will never allow anyone 
to alter or to allow for a space to come between he and his son, or us and his son. He will never allow for that space to come between. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. That's how we should be if we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We should allow nothing to separate us. Um, tell me, does, does Christ allow anything to come between the believer and his love for that believer? You already know the, you already know the passage quite well. Um, nothing. If you love your spouse, you'll do nothing to damage your spouse, male, female, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. And if you see that damage, you'll do everything you could possibly can do to correct the damage. Um, if you agape her, it goes without saying that you'll not commit adultery, does it not? If you love your neighbors yourself, you do nothing to bring mental, physical, emotional, spiritual damage to that neighbor. Adultery would be doing so. Secondly, Paul, on, Paul went on to say, thou shalt not kill. It goes without saying, there's an attitude behind this agape directive, of which we should all be aware. When Christ interpreted the law back in Matthew chapter 5, do you remember what he said? He said, ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is, what's the next word? Angry. Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. What judgment? Judgment seat of Christ. Christ was identifying the attitude behind murder, was he not? Thou shalt not kill. Anger is always an attitude behind murder. The real problem resident at the core of murder is the uncontrolled anger that the one person has towards another. But anger wears many faces, doesn't it? We church folk are far too pious to go out and kill somebody, aren't we? <laughs> we wouldn't want to do that. But what do we think about a little gossip here and there? Um, you know which emotion lies at the heart of gossip, according to psychologists? The answer is anger. They tell us anger. Do you suppose there's any harm being done to others in an em in when it comes to emotional murder? How about reputational murder? Just as anger wears many faces, killing wears many faces. Agape forgives others. Even as God for Christ's sake hath already forgiven us, Ephesians 4.32, and we read earlier, it's everything. The payment of our agape debt to others, the debt we owe others, Paul tells us, can be measured by the forgiveness we're willing to give others. If we're not willing to forgive, we're not loving, whether we say we are or not. Agape directive number three, thou shalt not steal. Why would anyone want to steal? Well, would need not be one, one area? How about need? That comes to my mind. Does Paul address that? Yes, he does. He addresses that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Notice the context. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good. Why? That he can amass a fortune? That he may have to give to him that needeth. It's love-related, isn't it? Even wealth, love-related. The one who recognizes his debt of agape to others is the one who has a mindset of finding ways to help others. That's the agape motive behind acquiring wealth. It, that's works comes through the work ethic. It, it is, that we might be the supply. We might be the supply point at the point of someone else's need. Especially, Paul said, to those of the household of faith. Um, Paul stated in Galatians chapter 6, an agape mindset concentrates on give rather than on take. That's why I said earlier in the lesson, when we come, is it to get, to get what we can get and we're not given that so we're upset? Or is it to come to give to those around us? And if we're there not to give to those around us, if we're not doing that, we're not practicing agape. You see how agape would fulfill the law if we were possible of doing that in this flesh? Agape is give-oriented. Directive number four, thou shalt not bear false witness. In a word, that would be lying about another person. This has to do with an untold truth for the purpose of damaging another person's reputation or another person's uh, stature in the eyes of the one you're telling about. If you're lying, you're damaging another individual's ability to trust. Additionally, if you're relying about another individual, you're putting that person in a bad light in the minds of those hearing the lie. The real question we need to ask ourselves in connection with being a witness in, in any form is this. What is the motive behind our witness? What is the motive behind that which we say? Is our motive that person's good? Is it their betterment we have in mind, or is it rather the other person's damage that we sometimes have in mind? A lie told about another individual is always done for the purpose of damaging the other or elevating self. Well, what if what you say is the truth about another individual? Does that edify? Does the truth always edify? No. Some things are left better unsaid than said. 
Finally, back in our Romans passage, Paul says, Thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandments, briefly comprehended right here, boil it down, love thy neighbor as thyself. To covet simply means to desire something that someone else possesses, uh, to want something that belongs to another person. How serious is covetousness? He spells that out in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, where Paul expands on what covetousness really is because covetousness covers a lot of bases. Here Paul writes, Mortify therefore your members, which are upon, render them functionally inoperative, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. Take them all and put them in a basket and shake them up. And what's it called? Idolatry. Worshiping things. Covetousness is nothing other than idolatry. In other words, it's making a god out of things. What does our apostle say about having a mindset set on things? I mean, he made more than one statement, but how about 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8? But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can take nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Here is that, where that well-known statement many have heard comes into play. We never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, and that's very true. Um, Paul sums up the idea of covetousness in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 with these words. Set your effect, affection on things where? Above, not on things on the earth. Let's wrap it up. Final four, final four verses of Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 15. Keeping in mind, once again, that chapter 13 is the chapter where Paul begins the final cornerstone of this great epistle of Romans. Uh, we've called the cornerstone of presentation. This is how we believers ought to be presenting ourselves to God in faithful or reasonable worship as we conduct ourselves according to the practice of agape. The debt Paul tells us we owe everyone in light of what Christ has accomplished for us at Calvary. Verse 11, And that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. Now, I not only sleep, I snore. <laughs> so some of us sleep a little deeper than others. Uh, chapter 12, The night is far spent, the day it is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Fulfilling the lust of the flesh, being governed by emotion um, rather than by sound doctrine, is nothing more than a focus on self. Being governed by emotion is a focus on self. Agape sets its focus outward rather than inward. How grateful I think we all should be that, uh, that God's not dealing with us, with us today according to the law of Moses. My goodness, wouldn't we be in trouble today, uh, just like Israel was in time past. But he's dealing with us today according to the unsearchable riches of his grace. That's just amazing to ponder. So let's think about that passage with which we began today's study, Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Opening chapter of the cornerstone we call presentation. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. So we'll conclude with that uh, today's lesson. We'll pick it up again next Sunday. And, uh Thank you for joining with us in your endeavor to discover the truths in God's Word. Pastor and teacher Kirk Christ and the entire fellowship of Welcome to Grace Ministries would like to thank you for your support of this ministry of grace. If you're enjoying the teachings and want to share with others, please write us at Welcome to Grace Ministries, P.O. Box 90, Penrose, North Carolina, 28766. You may call us toll free at 877-770-7098 or visit us on the web at www.welcometograce.com. Again, thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you.